Good morning. Welcome to Creekside Community Church. I'm Chris. This is the band. Uh, we're here to worship a true and living God this morning. We're here to hear what he has to say to us today. We're here to enter into um, the, his house, this space, his presence. So if, if you're able, if you can stand with us as we prepare to worship, to sing songs to our Lord. And just lift your hearts. Uh, I'll just briefly pray um, and get us started. Jesus, thank you for this morning, God. I pray that your name would be lifted up in this place. God, I pray that hearts would be lifted and um, would seek you out and that you'd be glorified. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
sins of men Holy Lamb You take away this thing I am Holy Lamb You say save myself I am healed by the blood of the Holy Lamb Saving Lord You took away the space
Good morning. I know we all love each other here, huh? Beautiful. So good morning. I'm Angelique Abreu. I'm one of the um, Creeks. <laughs> oh, no, I forgot what I am. Uh, I'm one of the directors over uh, community services here. And I'd like to introduce uh, you to one of our partners here um, who's doing some amazing work in the community and he just has something to share with you Tom Green thank you as you can see from the beautiful warm weather out there summer's in full swing and the thought on every parent's mind is when is that blessed day going to come back to school for many, it's, you know, how do I keep my kids occupied during summer? But for some parents, that day has a little dread to it. How am I going to afford the supplies to send my child back to school? That's really something I wish didn't have to happen, but it does. We're actually trying to assist in that. We have 300 students that have registered that are members of the families that come to the community food pantry that's held here twice a month that need help. They need backpacks and supplies and all that good stuff to be able to go back to school with the essentials to succeed and also with, you know, not the shame of I don't have what I need. We'd like to invite you to become a partner in that, to get involved personally. Out in the lobby, we have little cards with the name of a child and their grade. If you can, if you're able, purchase one backpack for one child. We're providing all the supplies. You don't need to do that. But just be able to provide that one thing for that child. We're also going to be providing another couple of hundred backpacks to new immigrant students in the Hayward area. These are kids that are coming from all over the world and have virtually nothing. Tons of needs out there, so we hope that you can be a part of it. Come see me if you have questions, or pick a child. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tom.
Welcome to Creekside. I'm uh, John Bruce, one of the pastors here. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Um, thanks for being here with us uh, today. If this is your first time, we're really glad you're here, and we would like to give you a, a gift of appreciation if you'd like that. You can pick this up out at the uh, uh, information desk. We've got a sippy cup, a water bottle, or a coffee tumbler. Also, if any of you have questions about our church, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. You can put prayer requests, requests for information, or any way we can be of help, and drop it over in the offering slot, and we will uh, uh, get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, I was going to say church is not a performance to attend, but it's a family to uh, uh, be part of. But you guys already said hi to each other before. You're so well-trained and uh, I'm amazed. So let's pray as we go to the scripture. And, and uh, let's ask Jesus, who is here with us, to calm our hearts, focus our minds, and then speak to us out of his word. Let's pray silently, and then I'll, I'll pray. Thank you for your promise, Lord Jesus, that where two or more are gathered together, you are here in our midst. Thank you for your living word that you use to save us and renew us and grow us. And we pray that you will be our teacher today. We really can't understand, believe, or apply these words without your help. We pray you'll be our instructor in Jesus' name. Amen. So this summer, we're in school together uh, in the Hebrews 11 School of Faith. Hebrews 11 is a chapter which lists the people of faith in the Old Testament, and each one has a particular lesson in how to live by faith to teach us. For the last two weeks, our instructor has been Abraham. Uh, Genesis 12 through 25 covers 100 years of Abraham's life. And so it gives us an opportunity to see the trajectory of his faith, how his faith grew. He starts off as a man of little faith. By the time his life is over, he's called the friend of God. He is the example of faith that's used in the New Testament more often than anybody else in the, from the Old Testament. And as we've gone through, we, we've seen, we can see Abraham's development of his faith in terms of three great tests. Uh, the test of Lot, the test of Ishmael, and the test of Isaac. Each of these tests involves Abraham's great desire to have a son, uh, the son that God promised to give him. But God doesn't give him that son right away and doesn't take the desire for that son away, but he uses that desire for a son uh, to teach Abraham to trust him. And, and Abraham's journey of faith parallels our journey of faith. These are three lessons of faith that God teaches us over and over again. The, the test of Lot is the test of leaving, leaving what we've depended on instead of God in the past and trusting in God's promises. The test of Ishmael is the test of waiting, uh, learning to trust God's timing more than our own. The test of Isaac, though, is, is the greatest test of faith and is trusting in God's unchanging character when everything around us screams, God has changed, God has deserted you. And that's the one we're going to look at this morning. I'm going to look at three things real simply of why this is Abraham's greatest test, how he passes the test, and then how to identify the Isaacs in our lives. That's, that's where we're going. So let's take a look at, we'll start off in Genesis 22 here. Let's uh, jump, we'll come back to that one. God finally answers, delivers on the promise he made to Abraham and Sarah when Abraham is 100 years old. And Sarah is 99, and, and Abraham is too old to father a child, and, and Sarah has never been able to have children, and finally, God gives him little Isaac. He's obviously God's gift. And Isaac becomes, of, as you might imagine, the joy of his elderly parents' life. Um, they must have had a lot of babysitters. And uh, 
But every day they see little Isaac, they're reminded of the faithfulness of God, how, how God reserves the best for those who wait, how God blesses those who trust him, and how good it is to know God. And as far as Abraham and Sarah are concerned, they've graduated from the school of faith. They've, they've learned to trust God and wait on God and depend on God, and now God is delivered to them. But they haven't finished the last class yet. And that occurs in Genesis 22. Let's, let's read this. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I will tell you. Now, it's not just that Abraham has to lose his son, because he's already lost Lot. He's already lost Ishmael, even though this would be the greatest loss, but that's not really the test of faith. The test of faith is, is that Isaac is the son God gave. Isaac is the son that God promised all of Abraham's descendants would come through, that the nation of Israel would come through, that eventually the Messiah would come through, and now God says, I want him back. So it's like God is completely reversing everything he said. That's why this is a test of faith. And, and the test of Isaac is when God seems to change. God seems to be a God we don't even know. God seems to have stopped being the God we believed him to be, and it, just the whole ground beneath our feet begins to shake because we just don't know this God anymore. And that's why that's, this is the greatest test of faith we'll go through. Lori and I uh, met at Lake Tahoe at a student project that both of us were staffing. And uh, I was very impressed as I got to know her. I was directing the project and, and uh, she, she loved to read the Bible. She loved to share her faith. She was one of the most encouraging, positive people I'd ever been around. And it didn't hurt that she was the prettiest girl I'd ever met. But I kept all that to myself because I charged ahead so often in these relationships, only have God say, nope, that's not the one. And be in bed. this one, I was going to do right. I wasn't going to let her know I was even interested. So that summer, I just prayed about our relationship, and we went on one date. That was the only one date, and she had no idea that I was interested in her at all. I had no idea what she thought about me. I did make sure that whenever our team went anywhere, she was always in my car. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, you know, everything was cool. So we, we, the summer's over. She's working in San Diego. I'm working in Berkeley. I'm praying like mad. God, please show me your will. But she has no idea what's going on. But... Her family lives, lives in Walnut Creek, so somehow I managed to find out anytime she would be up visiting her family and we'd go to the movie or something like that. But that, that's all that's going on. Second summer now, she's at Lake Tahoe, and here's my scenario in my mind. I'm not going to let her know I'm interested because I'm not going to mess things up again, but God will just have to show me that this is right. And that plan, as you can imagine, didn't work at all because... I found I wasn't getting to know her any better. And, and the reason is that why should she open up to me? I haven't evidenced any interest or stuff like that. I realize you can't have a relationship without risk. So that took a week of praying. And then finally, I just laid my cards on the table and I told her, look, at, at uh, my elderly age, I, uh, 28, um, I would not be spending time with you if I didn't think there might be a possibility for the future. Are you willing to seek God's will 
regarding spending our life, rest of our lives together. And fortunately, she said she was. So I began to think about, okay, so how do I expect, what do I expect God to do? What, how do I expect him to lead me? And I went back through all the ways God had led me in the past. And everything I believe the scripture talked about getting married and finding the right person. And I made a list of things that I felt if, if God would do these things, I would know God was leading me. And I thought, you know, what will happen is I'll pray about these things. And maybe a year from now, I'll be able to look back and say, God either did them or didn't do them. And that's, the way well, within two weeks, every one of those requests was answered in a powerful way. And God had, had made it very clear, just uh, there's been a couple of times I feel like through the scriptures, he's really impressed something on me. This was one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful. It was like God was almost saying, stop dragging your feet, step out on faith, ask her to marry you. And, and I, was, I was so excited. I was so excited. I thought, boy, God reserves the best for those who wait. This is so cool. I told my friends. They thought it was so cool, you know. And, and, it was so, and so we were in Fort Collins, Colorado for our annual staff training. And I made reservations at the nicest restaurant in Fort Collins. It wasn't hard to find. Um, <laughs> And we had a nice dinner there, and then I launch into my prepared proposal, but I only got into the first sentence, and I feel this incredible feeling of dread and terror, just like the last time when I was engaged outside of God's will. And I changed the subject, and poor Lori had no idea what I was even talking about. And I went back to my the dorm room I was staying in after dropping her off and just said, God, what are you doing? You, you lead me right up to the moment and then you rip the carpet out from under me. What? And I was, I was totally confused. Let's see why God is doing this to Abraham. Notice the first verse here. Back, can we go back up? up, up, up. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. What's going on here? God is testing Abraham's faith. And that's really important to see. Suppose your high school student came home with an F in history. And you say, what's this? He says, I didn't know there were tests. There's tests in every class. You can't learn without tests. Isn't that true? Same true as faith. Real faith is tested faith. It is through tests that our faith grows. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. God wants to develop our faith. And the way God develops our faith is he tests our faith. So it's really important that when the lights go out and God seems to be behaving differently than you've ever seen him be behave before, you need to remember this is a test. This is a test. Now I want you to see the difference of years of walking with God has made in Abraham. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. You know what impresses me about that? Here's what it doesn't say. And Abraham said to God, what's with this? I don't understand. You've got to give me a better reason for this than just a command. I mean, this is the, this is the son you promised to bring. My, there's, there's no negotiating. There's no s sitting down. I'm not going to move until you explain yourself because that doesn't require any faith. There, there's no delaying. The next day, Abraham obeys. He just goes. Isn't that interesting? 
On the third day, it's taken him three days to get to the mountain. God, three days for Abraham to get cold feet. Three days for Abraham to think about, what am I doing? I'm about to kill my son. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Anything strike you about Abraham's words to his young men? He doesn't say, I will return. He says, we will return. Abraham does, has no idea what God is doing, but he's confident that he will come back with Isaac. Isn't that interesting? Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamp for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. What is Abraham expecting God to do? God will provide. God will provide. I don't understand why God told me to do this. I don't understand what's happening. But I know that God is still the God I've walked with all these many years, that he has not changed, that somehow he's going to have to provide. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Here's the question. How was Abraham able to pass this test? I mean, God is, is behaving in a different way than God has ever behaved before. God is it, it looks like God is, is reneging on every promise he's ever made. So how is Abraham able to stay firm and keep trusting God and pass this test? Let's go to Hebrews 11 now. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. These first two verses show how difficult a test this is. Because it's not just losing Isaac. Isaac is the promised one. And if Isaac dies, all of God's promises die with Isaac. There'll be no descendants. There'll be no Israel. There'll be no Savior. It's like everything God said is false if Isaac is dead. So how can Abraham possibly offer his son Isaac in view of the, the stakes involved in this? Let's look at this last verse. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham thought God keeps his promises. God has promised to give me descendants through Isaac. So if he wants me to kill Isaac, 
he'll just have to raise Isaac from the dead. But I trust God. Isn't that interesting? A type is an Old Testament picture of a New Testament truth. How is Isaac a picture of something that happens in the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, there is a son who is sacrificed, is not saved from that sacrifice. In fact, Jesus dies on this same mountain, Mount Moriah. And God doesn't spare his son like he spared Abraham's son, but raises him from the dead as he is the sacrifice that God provides for all of our sins. That's how, so, so the test of Isaac is a test, the greatest test of our faith. It, it happens when it seems like God has changed. That God isn't the God we thought he was. And it is a test of faith. I believe every Christian will go through it one time or another. In fact, there is a whole book of the Bible devoted to this particular kind of test. It's the book of Job. As the book of Job opens, Job is the most righteous man in the world. He fears God more than anybody else, which God points out to the devil. He says, have you observed my servant Job? There's no one like him. He fears me. He turns from evil. And the devil says, well, of course he does. Because you put a hedge of protection around everything he has, you bless him. But take away your hedge of protection, he will curse you to your face. He doesn't love you. He just loves what you do for him. So God says, he's in your power. Everything he has is in your power. Let's see what happens. So we've got this, this story behind the story. This wager going on between God and the devil. And the next day, all of... Uh, all of Job's work animals are stolen by bandits and their, their keepers are killed. All of Job's flocks and herds, along with the shepherds, are destroyed from, with fire from heaven. All of his herds of camels are uh, taken by the Chaldean army who kill all Job's servants. And worst of all, Job's three daughters and seven sons all die feasting in their house when a great wind from the desert knocks the house down. And so in one day, Job has lost everything he owns and everyone he loves. And Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job refuses to blame God. So the next time Satan and God meet, God says, have you observed my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth who fears me and turns from evil. And even though you incited me against him, he still holds fast his integrity. He still trusts me. And the devil says, skin for skin, Everything a man has, he will give for his body. You know that, don't you? There, there are trials outside of us, but boy, those trials in our body, those are the hardest ones sometimes, aren't they? And God says, he's in your power, just spare his life. And Job immediately breaks out with large, smelly, painful boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Even his wife says, curse God and die. You can see why Satan didn't take her. <laughs> and this sets up, this sets up the rest of the book because for the next 37 chapters, it's, a, it's really a philosophical discussion between Job and his three friends and a young man named Elihu on why Good people suffer. And every one of the friends and Elihu basically say the same thing. God blesses the obedient. God punishes the disobedient. You must have sinned against God. And Job keeps saying, I don't think so. 
I don't, I don't, I don't think, I can't remember anything I did. Oh, no, don't be so self-righteous. For this to happen to you, you must have sinned against God. And Job gets more and more frustrated with his so-called friends, and he says, I just wish that God would explain it to me. I wish that God would come and tell me why this has happened. Yet, though he slay me, I will still trust him. Job is questioning. He's not, he's not, his faith isn't gone. He's still trusting God. He just wants to understand. In the last four chapters of the book of Job, God finally shows up. But we, God doesn't say what we expect him to say. God didn't say, well, see, Job, me and the devil were having this, this wager. He never tells Job why this. this we, Job never knows the story behind the story. All God's, God never even tells him why. He just says, I'm God. And, and I know stuff you don't know. And I do stuff you don't know, can't do. And I'm, I'm just God. And Job says, before I heard you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it's not understanding why this has happened to him, but understanding God and that he knows God better. That's the test of Isaac. It's just when God seems to be behaving completely different than we expect him to, and we keep trusting him no matter what. That's, that's, that's the test. And it's the greatest test of our faith, isn't it? Uh, when I went back to the, the dorm, my dorm room that night, I, was, I just was really struggling. I was mad at God. And I, and I said, God, why are you treating me this way? I followed all the rules. I didn't charge ahead. I've been praying about our relationship all along. I've asked, I, you say, if, if we commit our way to you, you'll direct our steps. Well, I've been committing my way to you for the last year. And I prayed, and you answered every one of my prayers. And you told me to marry her. And now, when I get to the moment of decision, you're gone. You just, you just, you're, you left, and I am just full of dread and fear, and what is the deal? And I had to go over my mind, okay, do I have any reason to believe that God has led me this far? And I, as I retraced my steps, it would take more faith to believe that God hadn't led me than to believe that he had. In fact, I would doubt I was even a Christian. I would doubt the promises of God if I had to say that this, I am not where God wants me to be. So I had to say, well, so what are you missing? What, why, why are you having these doubts? It's because of these feelings of dread I had. Because, see, I had in my mind, if you're in God's will, you should always have perfect peace. Right? As if that had ever happened. You know, every time I'd obeyed God, I was scared. And so, and I, rem and I remembered this story of Abraham we've looked at. I remember that for a hundred years, Abraham goes somewhere he doesn't know where he's going just because God said go. And every few years, God will appear to him and say, you're on the right track. I'm going to do all that. And he disappears. And he has to, it's not that God is holding his hand all the way along saying, you're okay, you're in my will, it's okay. Be, it's, everything's cool. It's like he goes for years and decades before God appears again and says, okay, remember, you're in the right place. You're going to get that kid. I'm going to fulfill all my promises. And I realized I was expecting God to do something he never promised to do. He's called me to walk by faith. So I decided the next night I would follow through on my proposal. And, I, and my wife will tell you I am romantically challenged. Um, <laughs> that I, I'm, I'm in, I am so embarrassed about my proposal because I look at how, what a great job my son did and my son-in-law did. You know, they made the, my proposal was awful. And, and uh, we, were, we were in my car in a dorm parking lot in a rainstorm. 
and when I, I explained I, why I really believed that God was leading us to get married and how I loved her and would she be my wife. And she, as an intelligent, faith-filled woman said, I don't know. I'll have to pray about it. And that began the longest week of my life. <laughs> Because I couldn't keep, well, has God said anything yet? You know, I, I, had to, I had to let her go through the same process that I went through before she finally said yes, and, and uh, all of our friends, and I, we were very, here's what I expected to happen. I expect that when she said yes, those feelings of dread would just magically disappear. They didn't. It would be a year before we got married. She's working in San Diego, I'm working in Berkeley. And every single day of that year, I have these intense feelings of fear and dread about getting married, even though the more I got to know her, the more in love I was with her, and the less able I was to see living my life apart from her. I was a, I was a divided man. And I had to just every day keep going back. Here is who God is. Here is how God has led me. Here's how I know that I'm in the center of God's will in spite of how I feel. And I was that the night before we were married. Poor Lori is up late making a dress for her mom for the next day. And I'm laying in my bed like this just full of dread. But after we were married, and those feelings of dread dissipated, and everything clicked into place, and I saw she is the perfect woman for me. And, and God, and, and here's what I learned, is that I don't know why, but there was something in me that was so commitment phobic that had to be burned out by 12 straight months of reminding myself every day, here's who God is. And I'm going to trust him even though I don't feel like it. And it's interesting that after we got married, we, we have made a lot of big commitments, a lot of big decisions purely by faith. Um, to, to buy our house without any money, um, to start this church, to, to homeschool our kids back before anybody else was homeschooling. All, we've, we made a, but I had no fear at all about making any of those commitments. And I think to prepare us for the life he'd called us to, I had to go through that test of learning to trust him. God is primarily concerned about teaching us to walk by faith and not by sight. And he wants to build your faith, and he will build your faith through tests. That's the only way faith grows, is by being tested. It may be the test of Lot. And having to leave things you used to depend on, but depended on instead of God, and stepping out on faith in dependence on God's promises. It may be the test of Ishmael, of, of learning to trust in God's timing rather than your own, learning how to wait on God. It may be the test of Isaac, learning to trust God when the lights go out, and nothing seems like the God you know is really in charge, and yet in spite of all that, I'm going to trust him. But all of God's blessings come as a result of faith. And the stronger your faith becomes, the more joy you have in him. The more of his power you experience, the more of his blessings you experience, that's why it's worth going through all these tests because you cannot experience the abundant Christian life that Jesus promised apart from faith. Let me finish with this. When God commanded Abraham to offer his only son as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, God knew exactly what he was asking him to do. 
because 2,500 years later, God would sacrifice his own son. Jesus is the sacrifice the Lord will provide. As Jesus dies on the cross for our sins and dies, all of us like sheep have gone astray. And God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And a Christian is not a good moral person who goes to church and, and crosses all the T's and dots all the I's and does everything perfectly because that person doesn't exist. A Christian is simply a person who recognizes they're a lost sheep, that we have sinned greatly against God, but God has provided an escape. God punished his sin so he wouldn't have to punish our, our sins in his son so he wouldn't have to punish us. And a Christian is just someone who accepts that free gift of salvation through Christ's death and resurrection. He says, I want that. Jesus, come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. That's the way we start this journey of faith. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the example of your servant Abraham. Thank you for recording his journey because it mirrors the journey you have all of us on. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters here, wherever we are on that journey, that you will help us to take the next step of faith you have for us this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. search the world but it couldn't fail me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came